went like this, because this is how I would get down here. Yep. Yeah. I, mean, I don't know if you want to come down here or not. Do I got to be uh, <laughs> tiny to get in there? No, you can you Can we come in from the other side? Well, we can, but it would make more sense if you went this way. Okay, I'll follow you. <laughs> oh, man. Good no, grief, bro. No, my six-foot husband's going to fit down here. You can. Huh? My, my husband's six-foot. I know if he can fit, you can. This... <laughs> Oh my gosh. I have to give Chris Madonna kudos for this. I would have never gone down there. This reminds me of that scene from Zodiac where Jake Gyllenhaal is going down the stairs in the creepy guy's house. Way to go. This is my, my husband's room. Okay. And over here, well, it's a mess again. That's all right. But this is where Summer and Little Whalen was. Who is YouTube's most effective criminal interviewer and what techniques of his can you apply to your own daily life? I'm Deception Detective. I'm an attorney trained in statement analysis and this channel exists to expose lies and manipulation. If you're watching this during your premiere, please come join me and the other detectives in the live chat. And if you're watching this after the premiere, make sure to check out the live chat replay for bonus content from myself and the other detectives. In today's video, we'll analyze an interview by retired homicide detective Chris Madonna of the interview room with the mother of Summer Wells, Candace, um, shortly after Summer went missing. We'll examine the techniques that Chris uses to elicit information, and we will run the information he gathers through a checklist of my own design for these situations. Without further ado, let's start listening. And for reference, I've um, linked this original video in the description. The first thing you'll notice, so if you're listening on podcast mode, you can't see this, but you can definitely hear it, is all the dogs on the property. This was live streamed a month after Summer went missing. All these dogs have allegedly been on the property for a long time. So the fact that the parents are so conclusive that Summer was kidnapped by a stranger, yet do not re report hearing any dogs barking on the property, is a giant red flag. And if you've seen the rest of my playlist about Summer Wells, Wells we're 10 videos in now, I am of the opinion that it is a plot hole. They didn't consider the fact that people would say, well, if a stranger came onto your property and took your daughter, why weren't the dogs barking? And then retroactively, they've come up with reasons why the dogs weren't barking. One of which is that all the dogs magically were off the property that day. So while that is possible, it is extremely unlikely. Dogs are not like migratory birds where they leave for a season and come back. These dogs look very at home here and they are very loud. Chris is pulling up in his car to the property. The dogs are barking. I imagine they would have done the same thing if a stranger had come up onto the property as well. The other thing you'll notice from this video is the house is up on a hill. So it looks like it's at the top of uh, a little valley and then it goes down into thick woods that you can barely see through. So the fact that the parents were so conclusive that Summer had been kidnapped, when in reality there's so many places that Summer could be hiding, even in the house, we'll see later how messy the house itself is, is another red flag. And I might as well introduce our checklist here, just so you can be aware of these things as Chris Madonna elicits information from Candace. So on my channel, we've analyzed lots of missing children cases. And these are the common themes that I see when the actual parent of a missing child does a public interview or a presser or even something as small as appearing on a YouTuber's channel like Michael Monkey Vaughn's mother when she appeared on the interview room about her missing son back in 2022. So we can expect parents of actual missing children, whenever they have an opportunity to speak to the public, no matter how small the platform, 
to do these things. First of all, we expect them to speak of the kid in present tense. Second, we expect them to be cooperative. So we expect them to be trying to answer every question that's posed to them, providing information, basically being proactive about trying to help. Without doing something that we see the McCanns do, which is trying to control the narrative. Right? So if you ask the wrong question, they refuse to answer. And then they just try to steer the conversation. So we expect cooperation, not just talking for the sake of talking, because that could possibly be someone trying to push an agenda. So present tense, cooperative, inconclusive. So unless there's evidence that a kid was kidnapped, like muddy footprints in the room or ransom note, we expect the parents of missing children to be inconclusive about what happened. All options are on the table, including a kidnapping, right? They could have wandered off. A dog could have dragged them off. An animal could have take them, taken them. If we're in Australia, a dingo could have taken the baby, which actually happened. So we expect them to be inconclusive. We expect them to address the kidnapper through the camera. So if they're talking into a camera or they have a platform, to say to camera, if you have my kid, please return them. There's a reward or I won't report you. Just please bring my, let my baby come home. Right? So to address a potential kidnapper through the camera. Also, we expect them to address the missing child through the camera, uh, like um, Gannon Stouch's biological mother did. Or um, I think Michael Monkey Vaughn's mother did that in this interview here, where they look into the camera and say, you know, uh, Gannon, Michael, if it, it, I know you're out there. Just hang tight. Mommy and daddy are looking for you. We're going to find you. We also expect them to ask for help. So they have to proactively say, so please help me find my kid. Not just answer every question that's posed to them reticently, like we saw the Wells do when they appeared on the Dr. Phil show, which I analyzed over the course of four videos. And you can find them in the playlist. The playlist link is in the pinned comment below. And then finally, we expect a call to action. So something along the lines of, if you see my kid, here's what they look like, call 911 or call this special number, right? Call 911 and then call this special uh, hotline. So let's keep all those in mind, those seven criteria that we're looking for in this interview. Also, I've watched lots of this. I'm going to point out the techniques that Chris uses, but just be aware he uses them subtly. And I'll point out the different style of interview he has than me just because of our separate trainings. Uh, but he also tells the story with his camera, which is great. So for example, he lingered on the barking dogs. He didn't have to say, hey, everyone watching, listen to all these dogs barking. That's a big plot hole in their story. Why, why didn't they report dogs barking on the day Summer was allegedly kidnapped? But he shows it to you with the camera. Here, look how he's lingering on these deep woods. Look how thick these trees are. Look how steep that hill is. Is it possible to conclude so certainly that your kid was kidnapped when there was a door to her bedroom that led out to this sort of dense woods? So notice the storytelling he does with the camera. This is one of my few videos that I recommend watching as well as listening. Normally my videos are made so you can just listen to it without having to watch. I'll do my best to describe what's being depicted, but uh, this is a good watch. Hey. Ouch. You know, I I have much more respect for what you're telling me 
by standing here yeah. and I've, I've got my little camera here oh, so but I look I'm looking at this terrain and I'm going holy cow she could have even there's a million possibilities here yeah, there's down thousands. there and there's the road so notice how so one of the techniques that Chris does is called it's not really an interrogation or even an interview what he's really doing is an elicitation he is trying to get the subject to talk. He's not searching for a gotcha moment. And if he gets a gotcha moment, he's not going to let the subject know. He, that's why sometimes, right, when I shared one of his videos in my member section a few weeks ago, people said, uh, actually, I shared this one, the Michael Monkey Vaughn video in my member section on YouTube. And lots of the comments said, hey, he, he goes so slow. I'll just wait for you to analyze this one, DD. Um, he's really taking his time. He's doing a lot of talking. And the reason for that is because he's trying to make the subject feel comfortable. He's trying to lead them down a path and trying to get them to be comfortable enough to slip up or to reveal something. Whereas what I do here is because I'm not in front of the person, I can point out the gotcha moments, the lies and point them out to you. So you can recognize when someone's lying to you. I'm not trying to elicit information from the subject. Um, I'm trying to show you what he, what these people are probably thinking when they catch the subject in a lie. Also, just by the nature of my training, right, as an attorney, when you're cross-examining a witness, you're not necessarily trying to elicit all the information from them possible. In fact, sometimes you don't want them to say certain things. Sometimes you want to restrict what they say in order for you to present a gotcha moment to the jury. You don't want them to fully explain themselves. So my style is not necessarily to elicit information. Um, eliciting information can be an hours long process. It can be very slow. You have to have a ton of patience for it. And you really have to have the sort of demeanor that Chris has where he's very calm and friendly but he is almost like Columbo, where he's playing a little bit dumber than he's a very intelligent guy, right? He's, he's toning it down so that the subject feels comfortable. So even here, notice how he said, wow, there's millions of possibilities. Look how thick these woods are. And Candace agrees with him. Well, now he just got her to admit her conclusiveness about someone being kidnapped was pretty premature because even she admits just how dense and wide and expansive these woods are, how many places Summer could have hidden. So he brings it up in a very different way than, you know, someone like myself uh, or probably even Pat Brown, another friend of the channel, would bring it up. Right? You can't be as direct when you're listening information. You sort of have to beat around the bush and let the person dig their own grave. Road down there. Yeah, that's the road. And that's my mom's house. Okay. Like literally, it's. And this right here. Usually, you can see the road because they have went through here and mowed okay. and took down a bunch of stuff away from the power lines. Okay. But usually, it's full up. You can't even see the road. Uh, that day, though, how was it? Was it full up they or was actually, it like? Actually, that day and a few days prior to that, they were working on this. Okay. So you, I, I've even come to a conclusion maybe one of them people have snatched. Oh, interesting. Because they were all the way up here. On yeah, I see. I see those. Uh, the path down there. I yeah. see the tracks down there. Yep. You over there. And they were all the way up here to my light pole. Okay. And you told TBI all this, I've right? I told TBI this. Yes. Okay. Okay. And yeah, I can see the cars going by. That is not far from your property. Mm -mm. Is there, is there a, a holler down there? I mean, is there a, a, a river of some sort? The creek runs all the way around the and, property. And how big is, how deep is the creek? <laughs> okay, just so it's like an inch, yeah. inch or two. Chris, once again, is bringing up another possibility. So there's a little creek down there. Could she have gone into the creek? But Candace rules it out, which is good. If she had said, yeah, yeah, there's a creek there. You know, it's about four feet. Chris might not point it out to her, but he might be thinking, Okay, so they're aware there's a creek down there. There's a, they're aware a kid could have fallen into the creek and drowned. Yet they were conclusive about the kidnapping. That's a red flag. Once again, if we go back to our, our list, actual parents of missing children, of which we've analyzed three on the channel. 
Uh, we analyzed two in my video, uh, what does an innocent parent look like? And then I gave a brief analysis about uh, Brandy Neal, the mother of Michael Monkey Vaughn, in my video, Liars Never Say This, in the Summer Wells playlist. What do they all have in common? They are all inconclusive about what happened to their kid because they simply don't know. So the fact that Candace is able to rule out Summer running off into the woods or being dragged off by one of those dogs or being dragged off by a bear or a coyote or any of the other number of animals she's listed in other interviews. Or she said she doesn't like walking around in the woods because there's bears and coyotes. Maybe it's unlikely that one dragged off her daughter, but it's just as unlikely as a stranger coming onto the property and kidnapping her daughter. Why were animals ruled out and a kidnapper uh, conclusively decided upon? That is the sign that they know more than they're saying, that they might actually know what happened to her and they're pushing a kidnapping narrative. Okay. You'd be lucky to get wet enough to do anything. Okay. All right, so let's let's pick it up from where, and I'm going to just use this little one. Is that Go okay? Car. Okay, so from where, when you got home, now my, she's leaning. My mom's truck parks here. Okay, your mom's truck's right here. Yes. Okay, so when you're, she's leaning against the milk. Is yes. she sleeping? She was sleeping, yes. Okay. I From exhaustion from that day? Yes, she was. Okay. Well, I woke her up early and she usually sleeps until 9, 10, even 12 o'clock if I let her. Okay. How did, how did the milk bottles get rearranged? Hunter said he had them on the floor and then he put them next to him. They weren't Is on that the, no. Okay, so walk me through that. Uh, when we dropped him off, they were actually still on his lap. Okay. And he put them on the other side of Summer. Okay. So he reached over? Yeah, he set them over there by that. That's a black tote she had in there. Okay. Was there, uh, where's that tote at? Uh, I think actually my mom's got it still in her truck. It's got a bunch of crafts and stuff in it. Okay. Got it. Got it. And now from when you pulled up, when she's, did she just fall asleep next to that? She fell asleep, I'd say maybe five minutes on the road. All right, so if you followed my Summer Wells series so far, this is the 10th video in the series in my DDX Summer Wells playlist. There are still other things to analyze about this story that I've not looked into yet, right? So just like we did with the McCanns or the Ramseys, we're peeling back the layers to try to get to the truth. So far, I think Candace and Don know what happened to Summer. It's unclear when they did what they did to Summer. I have a few theories about what they did. So if you want to see my theories, make sure to watch the rest of the playlist. I have some theories about what they did to her. I don't know exactly when they did it or who was involved besides them. One of the ways we'll get to the bottom of that is to figure out what they did earlier in that day. I know, for example, that earlier that day they took Summer and some other people to like a, a watering hole uh, to go swimming. So we'll analyze those interviews later. Right now, I want to focus on what Chris Madonna is going to uncover about the day Summer allegedly went missing and point out the techniques he uses to get there. Also, if you're a subscriber to his channel, I recommend subscribing. I've subscribed. Please let him know that I've reacted to this video. And hopefully he can respond and fill in any gaps or give his take on my analysis if we're catching what his thoughts were while he was doing this. Okay. Okay. Got it. And then, so walk me through, you get home, you take the groceries inside. Is Don no, home, actually, by the way? No, he's okay. not. Okay. Actually, I parked the truck and I opened both doors. It's really hard because this lawnmower is. But I opened the doors up and I shook some. I said, wake up. We're at home. She jumped right all right, here's, this is important. Another thing I need to analyze is Don's story about what he was doing that day. Don claims to have not been at the house when Summer was abducted. He claims to have been at work. But the way he describes it is bizarre. And here, once again, in his friendly, unassuming way, Chris asks, Candace, if Don was home, in fact, I almost missed it myself. He did it so subtly. He asks if Don was home when they got back from the watering hole. 
Let's listen to Candace's response. Remember, when someone's being honest about something that happened in the past, we expect them to speak in the past tense. Okay. Actually, I parked the truck and I opened both doors. It's really hard because this lawnmower is. But I opened the doors up and I shook some. I said, wake up. We're at home. She jumped right up. Okay. Like nothing. I unbuckled her and... And when you pulled up, when she's did she just fall asleep next to that? She fell asleep, I'd say, maybe five minutes on the road. Okay, okay, got it. And then, so walk me through, you get home, you take the groceries inside. Is Don no, home, actually, by the way? No, he's okay. not. Okay, okay. Is Don home, by the way? No, he's not. We can't read too much into that because he actually asked her that question in the present tense, right? Is Don home, by the way? Now, maybe he's actually asking her right now if Don is home. That makes sense. What I thought he was doing was saying, and was Don home, by the way? You know, subtly asking her if Don was home at this point in time and seeing if she would slip up and admit that he was. Uh, but now that I hear it again, it sounds like he's actually asking her, is Don home right now, by the way? And she says no. Okay. Actually, I parked the truck and I opened both doors. It's really hard because this lawnmower is. But I opened the doors up and I shook some. I said, wake up. We're at home. She jumped right up. Okay. Like nothing. I unbuckled her and I said, come on. I said, mom, I'll be right back. I went in there and got the boys and they were sitting on the table. And I it's interesting that she points out that Summer jumped right up. Like that's what I would expect a little kid to do is pop right up when you get home. She's pointing that out to us. Normally, I wouldn't care at all. But we have in this interview with her grandmother, with a Candace Wells in my video, how to develop new leads, seen some hints that there were sedatives or at least painkillers involved in that day's activities. They went to go pick up a prescription, allegedly for the grandma's hurt knee. However, they also said that after they picked up the prescription for grandma's knee, which was bothering her, they did gardening which is not an activity I would expect someone to do if their knee is hurting. If your knee is hurting so much that you need to go pick up painkillers, it's unlikely that you're going to then say, hey, let's start gardening. Let's start moving plants around. So what did they do with that painkiller or that sedative or whatever prescription they picked up? It might have been used on summer to pass her out in order to do whatever they did with her. And personally, I think that selling her is not off the table. Um, selling her as a way to collect money or to settle a debt with some dangerous people in that area. But the fact that Candace feels the need to tell us that Summer popped right up, as if that's surprising, is interesting. Right? And we'll just make note of it. So everything I point out doesn't necessarily mean that it's some sort of smoking gun. I'm just pointing it out to you as I hear it. Because let's say she tells us again how how peppy Summer was that day, or, you know, she wasn't tired at all. She wasn't super sleepy. Then we need to start considering why she's continuing to repeat this. It might be that she's aware that it's a lie. So inside her head, she's thinking, I really need to persuade everyone of that because she knows she's lying. So she's insecure about it. So she feels the need to really uh, push it. And I said, come on, let's get the groceries out. And we brought them all in the house, went through them all, and, and all that. And this is her, that's her swing. That's her swing right there. Come show me her swing. Why is this, and who's this? That is smoking boots. <laughs> that's my boy's cat. Right? And how many dogs do you have here on the property? About? Honestly, I don't know because people just keep dropping them off. Hi. Oh. So once again, Chris doing a great job of asking a very insightful question without raising Candace's alarm, right? So how many dogs here are on the property? The more dogs on the property, the less likely it is that a kidnapper was able to sneak on the property without alerting the dogs. These dogs are a major plot hole to their story. Oh, I know. Okay. 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 Sorry. So this is her swing. That's her swing. This is her playground. Yep. And she loved this area. <laughs> Boy, you know, I'm looking at this and this terrain, Candace, just strikes me as being so dense and just, 
Now, is that is that they say the dog trail? Where where's this dog trail thing? That uh, not sure honestly. There's so many of them. The dogs go in every different. Yeah, way. I saw the dogs came out of the. So notice how he's. This is why Chris is one of my favorite interviewers for true crime on YouTube. He is asking great questions. You can tell he's working on the theories, but he's doing it in such a friendly, low-key way that Candace is not alerted, right? So he just got her to admit that there's a ton of trails the dogs walk down, that the dogs are situated all over the property. So no matter which direction a kidnapper came from, how would she be able to conclude that the dogs didn't bark even though a, a kidnapper came onto the property? If I actually had all these dogs on my property... I would assume that it's not a stranger kidnapper who came onto my property. I would assume that Summer was hiding somewhere or ran off. The first thought in my mind would not be a kidnapping. Unless, of course, I was hoaxing and wanted everyone to think it was a kidnapping. Which, in my opinion, is what's going on here. It's also my opinion of what's going on in the Madeline McCann case. Out of the yeah, woods as we were pulling up. Yeah, okay. they do that all the time. Okay. That actually, that trail right there, my boys, they ride those dirt bikes that are leaning against the truck over there. Okay. You can see there's one of them. Okay. And they well, ride Those them. are like 50 cc's, aren't they? Yeah. Yeah, the that old That one ain't, I think it's only like 25, I think. Okay. But yeah, they go down that trail with their dirt bikes and then come back up on the road, up on the driveway and go around and stuff. What was it about this swing that is just so important for her? Oh, she liked it. I, she just liked to swing. All the kids did. Now, I don't, I don't want to talk about the boys right now because I know that's, you know, a tough another part of your heart, okay? Yeah. And that's none of my business. Right. I'm not here for it's any of it. You know what I mean? I'm not here summer. to judge anybody, right? right? I'm here to talk about Summer yep. and help you find Summer, okay? And help anybody help right. find her, okay? That yeah. messaging. Okay, so you go into the house. Go in the house. Uh, and can I follow you in, or do you well, you comfortable with that? Get out of huh? I don't know what I'm about doing. Still the cat, the cat room. Okay. And is this is this they're they're going to attack me? No. Oh, I was just I'm, te I'm teasing. I'm teasing you. The dog's going to attack me. So this is the this is the. Uh, the scaffolding you're talking about. Yeah, that's my. Yeah, yeah, that's okay, my so she comes up, jumps up, goes right in. Yep. Okay. How how many cats here? You know what? You should have like a zoo license. Yeah. You know, I'm seeing all kinds yeah. of no. of, oh. of critters, which is good. Okay, which is summer? Where's Summer's bed? Oh, it's in the basement. Got it. Okay. So what happens when she comes in? The boys are playing where? No, the boys are actually sitting here. Okay. And they're actually sitting right here at the table watching TV. Okay, so they're at the table yeah, watching TV. Again. Okay. All right, if you're listening to podcast mode, you can't see this, but this house is a mess. There's piles of clothing. There's clutter everywhere. It looks like an episode of Hoarders, and I said this in many episodes whenever they show this house. Summer could have literally been in the same room as the boys, and if she was being quiet, nobody would have seen her. Or if she fell asleep again, like they said she was sleeping in the car, she could be napping um, on a pile of clothes somewhere and not be found. So the fact that the parents are so immediately conclusive that Summer was kidnapped is the red flag. There is no evidence of a kidnapping. So they violate this rule on my checklist already, the conclusiveness. As you can see, Chris has brought up the fact that the property is full of trees, there's a hill, there's dogs. Candace has not said at all, yeah, maybe she wandered off. Or it's possible she wandered off. We've searched, though. Right? She does not jump onto any of these other possibilities. Why? It seems like she's not curious about them. Why would she not be curious about whether or not Summer wandered off? Because she knows what happened to Summer. That's my thought. Okay. They were all locked in. Nobody could get in. Nobody could get out. Okay. Thing. Now, who's just on up here? That's my little sister that's missing. Oh, that's Rose. That's Rose. 
Oh, wow. Yeah. Wow. And and who's the guy? That's her ex-husband. Wow. <coughs> do you think he had anything to do with that? I don't know. Okay. Yeah, we don't want to go I there. I can't but say. How's your mom deal with that? It's difficult. Yeah, I know. You know I know, right? So, okay, watching TV, where's Summer? Summer, she was with me. Okay, so t walk me through that. All right, well, we walked up in here, and we got Josie, Wyatt, and Waylon, the boys. Right, well, you we put went, the groceries down, right? Yeah, well, we went back out, and then we brought the groceries and put them down. And then Mom, she went took her stuff to her house and put her stuff away. Okay. And then, of course, me and Summer went back over to put our stuff away. Okay. You went back in. Yeah, me and Summer went back in the house. And then we were just doing normal stuff. Okay. Around the house like we normally do. And I come out, Mom was sitting there at the time I come out and I'm standing here. Okay. I was like, what are you doing? What are you staring at? She's like, these plants, I gotta get them transplanted. <laughs> I was like, well, I, Summer will help us, so I went back in. I got, by that time she was sitting on the floor. All right, so notice how vague the day is. <clears throat> Remember, this is the day her daughter was allegedly kidnapped. She's here with a platform to talk about the day her daughter was kidnapped in front of hundreds of thousands of people. This video has, this live stream has half a million views. She doesn't talk about any of the people down at the creek with them. Zero detail about what they did. Maybe something they did would trigger an idea in someone's head about what could have happened to Summer. She doesn't capitalize on any of that. So she's vague about what they did. And now she's getting into her story that she's told us in, in a, a bunch of other interviews that we've analyzed before. This story about her grandma with the bum knee wanting to transplant flowers, wanting to do gardening. Is it possible? Yes. Is it likely that an old woman with a bum knee who was in so much pain that she had to go pick up her prescription that same day would insist on doing gardening later that day? Is that likely? It's unlikely. Floor plan with the toys. Right here? No, in the in the kitchen where we were just at. Okay. She was actually sitting on the floor playing with the toys at that time. I said, Summer, you want to help plant flowers? And she jumped up, left her toys in us, of course. That's cool. Yeah, we well, that's what here. kids do. It's their job. What? Okay. We Get. walked over here and we transplanted these cactuses from the little pots that they were in. And transplanted these ones here into this bigger pot and that one into that bigger pot. And she took the rocks that we've gotten from different gem mines when we went up to Gatlinburg and stuff. Okay. And she was taking, she's the one that spread all the rocks around in here. And then she put her puppies in here and she wanted to chase in there, you know. Okay. So that was cool. Yeah. Where are those puppies now? What do you mean? What oh, the little puppies, the little, her ruins. Yeah, these little. Oh, yeah, those little guys. Oh, that's um, uh, Paw, Patrol. Paw Patrol. Yep. Yeah, that's the police one. Yep, that's Chase. He's always on the case. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. We oh, I there. see another one over yep. here. She put him in there. Yep, you're on the cactus. Okay, mm -hmm. don't, don't take those out, okay? No, I leave them right there. I know. And then we went in my mom's room. We can't get in there. Yeah, all, that's fine. Went in so there. We went in there and got some candy and stuff. She gets some grandma. Okay. And I said, well, I'm going to go back over to the house. She wanted to go back, so I said I'd go back, you know. Okay. And I brought her. I, walk, I literally walked over to here. I literally walked right to here where I could see the boys and on the kitchen table. Got them. And I watched her walk in there. And afterwards, when she was already in there, I walked over and I said, Why? And he looked at me and I said, Watch this, I'll be right back. And that's when I walked back over to my mom's. Okay. And I was fixing her brace and stuff like that. And I said, Well, mom, I got to go back over with the kids. And that's when I come back up into the house. Okay. With the boys. Okay. Not you walked into the house. I walked into here. Get up. I walked in here, and then three were sitting right here in front with their eyes glued to the TV, like always. <laughs> and I said, "Boys, where's your sister at?" Well, she just went downstairs, mom, to play. So I. I went over here like this, so this is where those stairs are. Okay. It's actually down under there. Oh, oh, down into her. Down. 
All right. <clears throat> so we've heard her tell this story in a bunch of other uh, interviews. It has the hallmarks of a scripted story in that it's beat for beat the same every time. And it does not have the reminiscence effect. So this is some something that people get confused with a lot with my videos. So I'm going to explain it very clearly here. <clears throat> All right. So when people make up a story beforehand, it's called scripting. So let's say Candace and Don sat down together to come up with the story about what happened that day. All right. So Don might say, all right, you're going to say that you were with, with your mother doing the flowers. Summer went inside. And then you're going to say that you went back to help your mother with something like her knee brace. And then you're going to say you went back and the boy said that Summer was downstairs and you went down there and discovered Summer missing. Now, if that story is true, what you can expect is whenever she tells that story to be thinking about other details, right? This was the last time allegedly that she saw her daughter. You would expect her to be racking her brain about it. And whenever she tells it, she might highlight a different detail. Like when I went in and asked the boys, they had the volume turned all the way up. So now that I think about it, maybe they didn't hear if the door opened downstairs or the volume was muted. So the fact that they couldn't hear anything downstairs might suggest that the door wasn't open, that the kidnapper was already inside the house or that Summer, you know, they might not have even seen if Summer actually went downstairs. So I checked the kitchen. So they add extra details to their story, but those details do not contradict the story. Whereas when a story has been scripted beforehand, there is no reminiscence effect. In other words, whenever they tell the story, they tell it exactly the same because they're scared of adding any new details that might conflict with what someone else said. For example, let's say Candace decided to add an extra detail on the fly to a fake story. Well, what if someone interviewed her mother who was also allegedly there and said, hey, when Candace came back to you, did she fix your knee brace or, or what was she doing? And if grandma says, well, no, she didn't fix my knee brace. We, we had a cigarette. We had a smoke. Now the story's blown. So when people script stories, especially when there's multiple people involved, multiple co-conspirators, co what happens is the story is rigidly the same every time they tell it. And we've seen that in the McCann's case as well, where whenever they describe going into the room to discover that Madeline was gone, Kate describes it exactly the same every time with zero reminiscence effect. Zero signs that she's considered what happened in those moments uh, uh, for hours on end and is trying to pick apart different details or questioning certain details. So the reminiscence effect is different than a contradiction. If someone tells a story and contradicts themselves in their story, well, then it's very likely the story's made up. And in fact, the reminiscence effect is so important, it's in my deception deck, which is my fav favorite 52 rules for spotting lies and manipulation. And I'll just read you the rule here. So honest people may change their stories slightly with each retelling as they recall and prioritize new details over time. Conversely, if a story remains rigidly consistent in its details, emotions, and sequencing in every retelling, it may have been fabricated in advance. This is known as scripting. And the example in the deception deck is actually uh, the McCann's, Kate's story about discovering that Madeline was missing. So whenever I hear Candace tell this story, it has the hallmarks of a scripted story story and that it's exactly the same every time. The only change she has made is the first time I heard her tell it, she said, I went away for two minutes. And when I returned, now she says, I went and helped my mom with her knee brace for two minutes. And then I returned. That's the only change I've heard. And I think that change was in response to questions from the police or people like Chris Madonna asking, well, what did you do during those two minutes? Down in the bedroom. our bedroom, and then hers is on the other side. 
Oh, okay, in the basement. Yeah, in the basement. Well, this makes sense now, see? And then I yelled, and I said, Summer, Summer. And she didn't, I listened for a minute, I didn't hear nothing. So I went like this. Is this how I would get down here? Yep. Yeah. I, mean, I don't know if you want to come down here or not. Do I got to be uh, <laughs> tiny to get in there? No, you can, you should can we come, come in from the other side? Well, we can, but it, it make more sense if you went this way. Okay, I'll follow you. <laughs> oh, man. Good <laughs> grief, you know, girl. I my six-foot hobbits if we can fit down here, you can. Huh? My, my husband's six-foot. I know if he can fit, you can. This... Oh, my gosh. I have to give Chris Madonna kudos for this. I would have never gone down there. This reminds me of that scene from Zodiac where... Jake Gyllenhaal is going down the stairs in the creepy guy's house. Way to go. This is my, my husband's room. Okay. And over here, well, it's a mess again. That's all right. But this is where Summer and little Waylon was, because Waylon's only nine. Okay. And they... So this is Summer's bedroom. This is depressing. <clears throat> this is scary. The fact that Candace is trying to portray herself as a helicopter mom, right? So I walked Candace to the door. I made sure she went inside. I told the boys to watch her. Then I went back to my mom. Then I came back. I called her summer immediately. It rings as false. Another sign that, that story is scripted because it makes her look so different than she actually is. Her story about what happened in those minutes is either heavily edited, in my opinion, or just totally fabricated. Because this is the reality of how she parented Summer. It looks like a mattress on the floor in a dingy, dark room connecting to their bedroom where a giant TV is playing like music videos or something. They stay down here. And these are all her toys, all her Paw Patrol. All, all her, her movies. She's got a movie about... The Savior? The boys I brought back down here after she went missing because I didn't want them upstairs by themselves anymore. Okay. And this is and all her toys. These are all her toys. All these toys that are down here are dang are all her, except for like the trucks and the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles in the game system. That's the boys. Okay. But them are all her all her toys. And she's really into Paw Patrol. I see. Yeah, that. I've been collecting from day one. And these are all her little ponies that we have bought. And then. These are them girls that she likes. Them new fashion. I don't know what they are. Little princesses or whatever. She just likes all kinds. Of, here's one of them bracelets. Oh, that's just uh, one of them. Can what do they call these? Oh, this is a little pony bracelet. Yeah, I don't know what yeah. they were really called, but she liked them, and so I just every time I go to the garage sale, I'd buy her what she wanted. Okay. You know, whenever I got a little bit of money, I spend it on the kids. Yeah, this is her, uh, this is, I, I understand her now yeah. even better. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, um, this is really important. Yeah. I think Chris, once again, remember, he's an elicitor. He is great at getting people to talk to him. If you had a good cop, bad cop combo, he'd be the good cop. I'd be the bad cop, right? The way we do the analysis here on this channel. Um, but he is very good at what he does. So when he says this is important, he's talking to the audience, right? The same way that Dr. Phil, when he's interviewing them, gives a little wink and a nod to the audience when he says, you know, I believe you're innocent. He understands that his audience sees that this looks like child neglect and debunks the story of the helicopter mom walking her daughter six feet to the house and all the way back to grandma's and then checking our daughter seconds later. This is the reality of, of how Summer lived in that house. This looks like neglect. Yeah, I come down and I searched. I looked up underneath the beds under there. We can't really get on. I can't get on there. Yeah, yeah. But I looked under there, looked under every blanket I could possibly look under. Yep. And then I come over here and I looked. Look on one side and see And I don't remember, I don't recall if this was locked or not. I okay. don't recall that. Okay. But I know, it's hard on But I know I did come out here and I said, Summer, because sometimes she'll sit right here and just sit here and play just for, you know. And usually when she comes out, she comes out and she goes directly that way up to the swing. Oh, okay. So this is like her. Yeah, she just. Will she come running out? 
You know, oh yeah, you can see the path so here. Right, to the swing. right, you can see where she could have run right, right. up to here. And this here. is all the further she would go. She wouldn't leave. Okay. She wouldn't go out nowhere else. All right, how can Candace know Summer wouldn't go out? Her daughter literally has a door leading out to the woods connected to her bedroom. Her daughter basically has a back door out into the woods. There were no she has not reported any dogs barking. If they were really good at fabricating stories, they would have said they heard dogs barking. This is just how hard it is to... The Summer Well story or the John Bonet story or the McCann story, in my opinion, are all great examples of just how difficult it is to create, to fabricate an airtight story. It's so difficult to do that even blockbuster movies with multiple script writers, supervisors, unlimited budgets, unlimited time, can't do it. No matter how well-crafted a movie is, you will always find a section on IMDb of the goofs or inconsistencies or plot holes, um, continuity errors. So if major Hollywood stories, professional story writers can't do it, what chance do two parents under the pressure of knowing they're going to be scrutinized under the pressure of time, not being trained actors, not being trained story crafters, what chance do they have to create an airtight story? Basically none. It's virtually impossible, which is why we see so many plot holes in these made up stories and people who are actually parents who need help and actually have missing children don't have any such plot holes. Okay. I want to go around this side. What is this blue thing here? Oh, that was, uh, we were putting, uh, trash in it. Okay. And we did have a trash man at the time, but he stopped running. Oh, wow. I got lost this. Okay. I'll be, uh, I'll, I'm going to film around this side. Now walk me through, what's this little, uh, Oh, that right there? A little cave thing there. That's not really a cave. Actually, we built this addition, me and Donnie and the kids. Oh, okay. And we left this part open because the dog... So once again, Chris pointing out another option. Candace said she searched under the blankets in Summer's room and under the bed. And then concluded that Summer was kidnapped. What Chris is doing in his own very subtle way is probing alternatives. Did you consider um, that she went out into these dense woods? He asked about the creek earlier. Did you consider she went to the creek? Now we have a, a weird cave thing under the house. Is it possible she went in there? I have not watched this far into this video, but I'm curious if he's going to ask her about other animals like coyotes or bears. That would be a good probe to do as well. Because if she didn't consider the bears that she's mentioned in other interviews, or consider the coyotes she's mentioned in other interviews, it's just more indication that she's being conclusive without evidence, which is the sign of a hoax. Well, at the time, we did have little puppies. They, these dogs were little puppies. Uh -huh. And we let them go under there. They would run in and out of the bricks over there. There's actually seven pups up under there now. Okay. And it's always been open like that. Well, you can see, after you've been here, you can see how mellow the dogs are. Yeah. Yeah, I know, right? You. That's what they do. They're and, lazy. <laughs> they're kind of a Jack Russell. They got a little Jack they're Russell. Jack Russell, yeah. Actually, um... The gentleman that lives over there in the other trailer across the creek actually has the mama to that dog there. Mm -hmm. The audio is cutting out here. What's this little shed over here? Oh, that one there? Yeah. That's where Donnie keeps all his tools. Got it. Hey, can I go look? No. You can go look, but it's a mess. No. Okay. No, it's up. To, okay, that's fine. Nothing in there. Yeah. No. No worries. I don't want to get a get. 
All right. So Chris asks to look in the shed. Candace says no. This violates another one of our rules, cooperativeness. Remember, she has an experienced homicide detective attending to her missing child right now, streaming to his audience of viewers. And she's saying, don't look in the shed. I don't care what is in the shed. Imagine if it was something embarrassing or humiliating to her. I would still expect her to let him into the shed because her missing daughter is the top priority over everything else. So we have her violating these two on my checklist. Cooperativeness has just been violated and inconclusiveness has just been violated. Notice how she has not addressed any potential kidnappers yet in this video. She has not addressed Summer in this video. She has not asked Chris to, um, she has not said, for example, you know, can I talk to your audience, Chris? If you, you know, if you're out there, please help find Summer. This is what she looks like. Here's a photo. She hasn't done any of that. She hasn't said, if you see Summer, call 911 or go to this website. Whereas on Michael Vaughn in this interview, same guy, same situation. Both mothers are aware they're doing a YouTube interview. Brandy Neal made sure that Chris had this scrolling across the bottom of the screen. Find Michael at fruitland.org for any tips to go to. And if you watch, were to watch her interview, you would see that she um, says, if you see Michael, call 911 and then call this number. She asks for help in finding Michael. She addresses Michael through the screen. She addresses potential kidnappers through the screen. She's inconclusive about what happened to him. He could have been kidnapped. He could have run off. It's unclear. Why is it unclear? Because she really doesn't know. Notice how I speak about Summer Wells. I don't actually know what happened to her, which is why I'm not conclusive that she was kidnapped or conclusive that she wandered off or conclusive that a bear didn't drag her off because I don't know. I just have a best guess. And that's how actual parents of missing children speak. They're curious about what actually happened. They might have a best guess about what happened, but they're not sure, which is why they present so much curiosity and why they think about it so much. And then um, uh, Michael Vaughn's mother was extremely cooperative. She answered even you know potentially embarrassing questions, and she spoke about Michael in present tense. And in fact, at one point when Chris referred to Michael in past tense, Brandy corrected him and put it into present tense, which might have been a clever ploy from Chris to see if she would make that correction. And I think he did that earlier in this interview when he was asking about the swing. He said it in past tense, and then he said it in present tense to see if Candace would correct him or not. Um, the thing with the swing is, though, it's possible Summer enjoyed it at some point, so saying it in past tense doesn't necessarily mean, doesn't reveal any guilty knowledge. Get in. I don't want you to get hurt. In my well, and, and you know what? I, I don't want other people to. I don't let my kids in there either. Yeah, yeah no it's problem. Not a place for I totally respect that. That's not a problem. Not an issue, but I think this is interesting because this is, you can really clearly see oh, yeah. where she runs on this path down here. So notice the deep woods. There's a wood line maybe a hundred yards from a door leading into Summer's room. Huh? How do you not know? How do you, how do you know for sure that an animal didn't come out of that wood line and snatch her, or that she ran in there? She's going to emerge an hour later, right after getting wandering around or getting lost. Uh huh? I said it's not the most beautiful house in the world. You know what? It's a house. It's a, it's a house. You know what? <laughs> you know I. God forbid, you know, anybody judge you for having a bad house. You know, I mean, it is what it is. At least you're putting food on the table. 
oh, and seen the food trying to do your best. I saw. I saw. And then Allie says that she bought. The food. And then this is uh, over here. Oh, this is our this yeah, this is where you do your fire for the yeah, kids. Fire that heats the. Is that an old generator? Yeah. Does it work? No, did it at some point? It worked like over 14, 15 years ago, way before I was here. Old school bus, you're gonna turn that into a camper? That was my mom's plan. I literally actually rode that bus when I was a little kid. Whenever I see a school bus, I always ask that question. I did. Okay, tell me about it. Uh, uh, me and my mom. All right, so we're coming up on an hour here. Uh, let's get this video to 50,000 views if you want a part two. And if you like this one, uh, do let me know if you want me to do more analysis of the Chris Madonna interviews. He's interviewed a bunch of people involved in this case. And maybe we can peel back the layers through the information that he elicits from the people involved. Uh, do make sure to subscribe to his channel. Before we wrap up, I'm going to play a few minutes of this, of Chris's interview with Brandy Neal, the mother of Michael Vaughn, just so you can see the difference between these two mothers. And if you're a member of my channel, You'll have seen that post I did, and you can read in the comments all the other takes of the other detectives have on this interview, all the things that she does differently. Um, and you can compare her interview if you want to do some practice on your own along this checklist compared to Candace's interview along my checklist. All right, so I'm just going to play a couple minutes of this before we wrap up. You know, you, you did what you had to do, and, and, you, and right now and so far, you're doing it right. And your job is to continue to just take deep breaths and, you know, process this. And it's, it's your job to keep him in the public's eye. Okay. And, and it's hard. It's hard. It really but, is. <laughs> but you're doing it. You're doing it. Okay? And, and I commend you for that. And, and it's not like something you want to do. It's something you're now in a position that you have to do. Okay? Because if he hears your voice or sees your face in any way, shape, or form, and he's in an environment that, you know, he, you know, whatever, okay, we want him to know that you're there. Mm -hmm. Okay? You're there. Yep. Okay? Yes. And Notice how Chris is aware this is a YouTube interview, but he still has the same criteria for the parents as if they were on the Dr. Phil show or doing a, a presser with the local police department. He expects them to address the child. He expects them to ask for help. He expects a call to action. So I'm certain it's not lost on him when Candace didn't do any of those things in the portion of the interview we analyzed. Now, maybe she will in the second half. I've not analyzed it yet. But if we do a part two of this, we'll see. Is she going to fail on all counts of the list? Or will she hit some of them? And if she does, we'll have to factor that in. Yes. And you've been doing a heck of a job doing just that. So you you hang on, right? Just keep keep plowing forward and and trust. And not only in God, but trust in yourself and trust in the authorities to let them do what they do. Okay? And you become the voice of, of reason and the face of, of monkey out front. And we keep him out in the world. The world has to come to know this little boy. Yes, they do. And they will. Okay. okay? And then we want to make sure that if anybody has any information uh, about this case, there's the inform the the trail going on right there. Find Michael at fruitland.org. Right. So once again, Chris expects a call to action and for the subject he's interviewing to ask for help. Hopefully he watches this interview. I would love it if he's in the live chat uh, during the premiere, but I'm curious if he has his own checklist that he expects to see. And if you would add to this one, because he is an elicitor. He is someone who is great at getting people to talk. He will let them check off the checklist on their own or fail to check it off on their own. And call the authorities, call the authorities at the Fruitland police department. I want to make sure I get the right number here. 
Uh, I've got a couple of them, but show. I'm going to put this one. Two zero eight six four two six zero zero six extension zero. Okay, hang on for a minute. So see, Brandy has the number memorized that she wants people to call, probably because she's recited it so much and memorized it specifically for this interview. And if you are to watch this interview on his channel, just be aware that it is slow going in the beginning because he's putting her at ease, right? He doesn't know if she's innocent or guilty uh, when they first get on the call. So he spends a lot of time putting her at ease, working her uh, to feel comfortable talking to him. And then once she gets talking and he allows her the room to talk, she says lots of the right things. So I get lots of comments of people saying, hey, DD, you know, have you ever seen a parent who you didn't think was guilty? Well, of course. And this is one of them, the biological mother of Gannon Stouch. So his actual mom, not the stepmother, Letitia Stouch, who killed him. Um, I said rang true. There's other parents I've analyzed who also rang true. The thing is, when I analyze honest people, those videos tend to underperform on YouTube because there's not really that much to say, because I'm not pointing out deceptive markers. There's no gotcha moments because they're telling the truth. So um, when people say, hey, DD, why do you always analyze liars? Uh, that's why, right? It's, it's self-selection. My channel is about spotting deception, so it should be no surprise that I analyze liars. But I did want to point out this one that I believe this mother is being honest. Um, because it's a good comparison and she hits all the things on this checklist. So you could actually run through this yourself um, to see it for yourself. So you could do what I do on your own if you were to watch both these interviews. All right. So uh, let's get this to 50,000 views. If you want a part two, uh, please make sure to like, subscribe, comment for the algo until next time. Stay true.